Good morning, everyone. My name is Sonia from technologycatalog.com, and I would like to welcome you to our new webinar about the future directions of lifting and logistics. Before leaving you with Derek Markwell, the founder of Roborigger, I will briefly introduce you what we do at Technology Catalog and the structure of this webinar. So at Technology Catalog, we want to make um, finding technology in the energy industry very easy and immediate together with all required support to deploy these technologies. As a matter of fact, uh, a current problem is that there is a very wide range of available solutions which can cause confusion about what are the best technology investments for your business. And we really want to solve this issue. Another good point is that it's a great opportunity to explore new technologies without having to travel. I would like to invite you to visit our website to find and compare new technologies that have uh, a huge potential to enhance your business. Just to give you some general information, uh, the webinar is going to last around 15 minutes, uh, 10 minutes for presentation, and the final five minutes dedicated for your questions. So if you have any, please use the chat box on your right. I will now let the stage to Derek, who will lead this webinar and sharing his insights on the future directions for the lifting and logistic industry. Ah, <clears throat> welcome, to, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Derek Markwell from Roborig and we're based in Perth, Western Australia. And we claim to be the most isolated capital city in the world. The upside of this is that we've been able to close our borders and keep ourselves free of coronavirus for three months now. So fingers crossed it stays this way. In Western Australia, we're very strongly focused on the resources industries, iron ore and gold mining and offshore liquefied natural gas production. We also have onshore high rise construction. So we see a great diversity in the lifting and logistics operations in different industries. Now, before I talk about the future, I think I should talk about where we are now with lifting and logistics in Australia. There's quite a lot of information on the slides. You might not have time to read it while I'm talking, so I urge you to download the presentation and read it at your own pace and feel free to send it to your colleagues. Firstly, let's look at onshore construction. Here are two photos I took last year which show construction workers working very close to loads and relying on their skill and the coordination between themselves and the crane driver to avoid injury. In the left one, you see a guy standing on the stack of crane jib sections holding on with one hand whilst trying to control the load above him using a tagline in the other hand. And over here on the right, you see a dogman in a very tight space orienting the load above him before it's lowered down right next to him. And both of these cases are typical of construction sites across Australia. Now, in the resource and mining industries, things are different. There's a move amongst the leading companies to keep away from lifted loads. So on the left, you see cones and warning signs. And on the right, you can see the dogmen using a boat hook like sticks to move the loads as they're not permitted to touch the lifted loads. However, taglines are still used and the boat hooks only move the people a few metres away from the last stage of the lift when the load's close to the ground anyway. So the personnel is still standing under the crane boom and close enough to be injured if the, the load falls. So what can go wrong? Well, crane failure. Here are a couple of photos showing what can happen. Disastrous. And here's some more. I'll show you some videos in a second. And these explain why just being near the crane poses a risk. You don't want to be anywhere near the crane. Um, relatively new equipment can also fail. So if the braking system fails, the load gets dropped and people get killed. Controlling the load also creates risks. And I'm sure you've all seen loads spinning in the wind high up on building sites. And on the middle photo there, this equipment was spinning in the wind for 20 minutes on a site in Sydney before it slowed down enough for the riggers to grab a tagline and land it. Um, other times, the taglines are attached to those loads and they get caught on the structure. Controlling loads offshore is even more hazardous. At the end of the following videos, you'll understand why being on the back of deck of a boat at the same time as a load is hazardous and why we are looking at eliminating this risk. I'll show you a video. Now, 
Now, this is amazing footage of a failure last year that fortunately happened on a Sunday when no one was around to get injured. And in this one, there was enough time for people to be evacuated, but fortunately the crane collapsed before the firefighters arrived to put out the fire. And here's a common example of a log object spinning in the wind. And this ex video explains why it's an advantage to orient, land and disconnect loads offshore without requiring personnel. And the last clip highlights the challenges when trying to lift or lower loads that need to be placed alongside each other offshore. Let's get on to the next slide. So there's still lots of unresolved issues associated with lifting. Um, you have workers near the site and underneath the loads. You have the, the difficulty in actually changing the culture of the workforce. So the workers don't really understand why they need to do something differently. You need access to get up there to disconnect loads. You have the risks from crane failures, loads spinning in the wind, rigging and equipment failure, difficulty in communication, and also parts of the load falling off when they're bundled together and the loads hitting the existing structure. Now let's look at state of the art in lo of logistics. We're all familiar with how the FedEx and DHL parcel tracking systems work, where they use barcodes, QR codes, RFID tags to log items as they arrive and depart from specific scanning stations. We know you can track your vehicle fleet or your container continuously with a GPS device that connects via 3G or satellite and displays the location in a web browser. And these are great for well-defined and repeatable operations. But when we're talking about the resources industry, the requirements for projects are so much more varied. If you're using containers, you still don't really know where your cargo is in the container. You don't know the condition of your load when it was put in the container whether someone has opened the container and actually removed your, your cargo. And if you aren't using containers and your cargo is on a pallet, it's even harder to know. You know, is it going to arrive in time? What condition is it going to be in when it arrives? Because there's a lot of human input to get it to site and to track the load. There's some really good tracking and logistics applications out there, but they all require a lot of manual input to set up and to perform the tracking because you need to label or identify everything and you need to meticulously capture every item at each scanning point. This is slow, expensive and you generally only get a date and time of scan and the station name. You don't get an image, you don't get the weight, the condition of the load, the exact position and the time when it was loaded onto a vehicle. And electronic tracking devices are also too expensive to go onto every item. So where do the systems fall down? On the left-hand picture, the, um, you can see the issue of consolidation of loads. Your gear is somewhere mixed in with a container full of other stuff. You know, is it still in one piece? When they unpack the container, do they accidentally take your gear with theirs? You know, it's arrived, but where is it stored after the container was unpacked? Now, on the centre picture, example of you've been told your gear is on this site, but where is it? And maybe there's a pallet load that's been misplaced in the process, so now it isn't where it should have been. How can you find it? And for gear going offshore, you know, it's in one or more containers. It's on the boat. Did they offload it today? Did they unpack the container and return it? And is your gear now somewhere else? And then there's the problem of storing and returning all those empty containers going offshore. So manual input into computerised systems uses teams of site logistics people. It's expensive and there'll be errors. Radio and GPS devices are expensive and they don't even work inside containers. And finally, the corporate systems are managed by IT guys who often value data security so highly that they lock the system down to the point where it's barely usable and accessible. 
So now we come to how we can tackle these issues. Well, we're not going to change and fix all the lifting and logistic issues overnight, but we need some key enabling technologies to be in place, and then we can build from these into RoboRigger. RoboRigger is a battery powered device which can orient loads using the momentum of a flywheel. Therefore, to turn the load clockwise, we accelerate the flywheel anticlockwise, and the reaction from doing this causes <clears throat> the load to rotate in the opposite direction. Simple as that. Well, not quite. Um, this is controlled using a wireless remote with very simple controls. Turn, turn right, turn left, hold it steady, or let it turn. You can see the remote there. The system also has a load cell, a GPS camera, and everything is monitored over the internet. So not only does RoboRigger control the load, but it captures all of the information needed for a state-of-the-art logistics tracking system. Now here you can see two lifts. I'm looking at the issues that need to be addressed. Two lifts being done by RoboRigger without taglines. On the left is an 18 by 4 metre panel being lifted to level 88 on a high-rise building in Melbourne, and RoboRigger prevents it from spinning. And on the right, a nine tonne rubble skip in central Sydney is lowered parallel to the hoarding and landed in a narrow space on a busy street, traffic still flowing in the adjacent lane, and no one is near the load. Here's another example of lifting with no personnel near the loads. At the top, lightweight hinge lock aluminium lift frames that pack away into a small crate are being used to lift screened casing. And below, our largest robo rigger allows large loads to be lifted, oriented, landed, and disconnected with no personnel near the load or under the crane. And note the remote release hook attached to robo rigger that allows the rigging to be laid down and disconnected on the vessel deck alongside the load. And this has to be the way for the future for loading offshore supply vessels. <clears throat> Now, workers aren't going to suddenly change their ways, even when they have RoboRigger. So to help change the culture of the workforce, RoboRigger uses artificial intelligence to identify personnel in the vicinity of the load. It then sounds a warning horn. RoboRigger then logs all of these occurrences and produces statistics so improvement can be monitored. And you can see some thumbnails of the types of reports that are produced at the top of that slide. RoboRigger records the date, the time, the GPS location, the weight of the lift, and can also read an RFID or QR tag. For every lift and for set down of a load, it records an image of the load, so every time your load is handled by RoboRigger, you have all the information you need, and it's accessible via any web browser on a phone or a PC. So in summary, the data collected by RoboRigger helps address the challenging issues associated with the resources industries where simple GPS or RFID tracking often isn't appropriate and manual input into a computerised system is prone to error, doesn't provide the information needed and is very expensive. Now here are some examples of where RoboRigger has been used in projects typical for the resource industry. Um, this one's for handling pipe at a pipe coating yard in Indonesia. This one's um, erection of structural steelwork in Newcastle, north of Sydney. And this one's handling tubulars bundled with lightweight hinge lock aluminium frames. These frames are then packed by hand into a small crate for backloading. So the combination of RoboRigger and the hinge lock frames means that the pipe bundles are controlled during lifting, so heavy protective containers such as, as, <clears throat> such as you see in the bottom right hand corner aren't needed, and then the hinge lock packs into a small crate for return to the beach. So I hope that today I've shown you how the lifting industry 
can move towards operations where personnel can remain clear of the lifted loads and also clear of the cranes. I also hope you can see how data can be captured automatically so that much more information is available immediately and accessible online to everyone who needs it. At RoboRiga, we have a vision to be at the forefront of these technologies and our products are the enablers that will allow these changes to happen. There's lot more, lots more information and videos on the RoboRiga website and you can also email me if you want more information. So thank you and now I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Derek. It was a super interesting presentation. So again, uh, we hope you have a few questions to ask Derek. So use the chat box on your right. And in the meantime, I may ask you myself a couple of questions. For example, um, Rob Rieger, uh, has it been used offshore? Uh, look, it hasn't yet, but, um, and the units aren't really designed for offshore use immediately. We, we do have units that are going to be tested offshore. And once we've actually got more information about the requirements, we'll then build proper offshore rated units there. At the moment, they're not hazardous area rated, so they're not suitable for use on uh, live platforms. Um, but we are, we've got lots of interest from the, the drilling and the offshore supply industry to, um, to develop units that can load supply boats. And, and our unit that we are supplying to Woodside will be tested for that application. That was really clear, thank you. Um, second question, and yeah, let's see if uh, our audience uh, wants to ask us something as well. Um, you said in the presentation that the battery, uh, I mean, Robo Rieger is battery powered, but how long does the, the battery last? Yeah, the battery life depends on the how, how hard you're using it. Uh, on the building sites, we've found that the batteries will last two, two shifts, so ba basically two days. Um, it's when you have to hold loads in very strong winds that it uses battery, but if you're actually just rotating loads and controlling them uh, in sort of normal conditions, you'll always get 12 hours and often around two days or two shifts of 12 hours. Right. Um, you also said that you're Australia based, correct? And yeah. um, is your technology available also outside of Australia? Uh, well, right at the moment, we're into a, um, an overseas expansion phase and we've recently sent a unit to Singapore and had it certified for use up there and done demonstrations. And we're building units that are CE rated and they'll be coming out of the factory around the end of September and we'll be sending them to Europe, Japan and uh, the Middle East for trials then. So um, yeah, we are, our plans are to be well and truly overseas by the end of the year. Right. Um, I see, yeah, there is still no questions. So maybe I can ask uh, one last. And so how long has Robberigan been in use for? The first units went actually on site uh, in December 2018. So we're really, uh, what's that, 18 months, um, and it'll be, be two years at the end of this year. So the AR-10, the unit that looks pretty much like this, um, is a fairly proven product. Um, the bigger units we've only delivered this year and so they are, um, they're still at the prototype testing phase where we're putting them on site and, and learning about how they perform. Right. Okay. Then, well, as we don't have any further questions, um, yeah, maybe we can wrap it up. And I would like to thank you, of course, Derek, for being here this morning and uh, also to all our attendees. Oh, we have a question, sorry, yeah. from Brian. <laughs> Ryan, awesome. Um, what was the initial development process like? Were there any hurdles or challenges you met along the way? Actually, no, we got it right straight away on the first iteration. Um, <laughs> yeah, there are lots of them. Um, the thing about RoboRigger that's special is that we actually have a fan on board RoboRigger, so we can provide a continuous rotating torque. 
Um, there was no theory available for design of fans, so we had to do all of this by experimentation and prototype testing to develop the math mathematical models for how the fan worked. Um, the control system was also extremely tricky because the the unit is like a whole bundle of springs reacting against each other and we, we had lots of oscillation in the control system and we had to sit up in the lives with Curtin University to um, assist us in getting the control system sorted. So it took probably um, two years to basically build four different prototype stages and, and resolve all of those technical issues. Um, we're getting quite a few questions. So from Thor, um, who is behind Robbery Gear and how many units have you built? Well, right now I'm right behind Robbery Gear. Um, the, um, it is something that's that I really came up with, but I've got a really strong team of um, engineers now who are helping me. Um, and we've built 18 to date and we've got another 20 that will be uh, completed within two months. So that'll be 38 and then we'll have another uh, 10 units built probably by the end of October. So there'll be about 48 units built by the end of October. Sounds great. Um, and I want uh, thank you for the great information provided. This is a great product. Uh, what would be the requirement for maintenance on the Roborigger expected mission time? Um, in terms of maintenance, it's actually extremely small. Um, it, it's electronic batteries, electric motor, control system. Um, we've got a grease nipple on the swivel and really checking out that all the control systems and electronics are working. Uh, we have a radiator for the cooling system, so you check that once every couple of weeks. Um, the reality is that the maintenance is virtually minimal. Um, the what was the other question is it's what's the how long does it last I think was what you were really asking we we're designing it for a five-year life and it's probably not so much that we think it'll fall apart at the end of five years but we believe the technology will have changed in terms of batteries and motors by then that probably this unit will be so superseded um, there'll be so many better opportun op options available Right. Um, then from Graham, um, excellent information, Derek. Look forward to hearing more on the European units when available. Nice. Yeah, very soon. Thanks. Um, uh, Nan is saying, uh, how is the equipment diagnostic information captured, such as lifting and rigging and equipment faults? Okay, we have on board, we have a what we call a management computer, which is internet connected. And so all the sensor information is logged every 100 milliseconds. So on board we have that information and whenever there's a what we call an event, which could be a, a problem or a lift or a set down or a start up, or if it falls over or receives an excessive acceleration, or, there, or that there is a fault detected in the system, it sends a message to the internet. So they are monitored online uh, continuously and if there is something else that's a little bit more challenging, we have the, a, an enormous amount of information stored locally that we can then download to to get um, we you know, every sensor and, and device is monitored so we can get that information. So we should be able to maintain these extremely well remotely with only um, a small amount of technical support needed locally. Perfect. Um, then I think we can uh, ask the last question for this session from Koyu from Tokyo. Uh, how long does it take to install the blades of onshore wind turbine? Um, actually, I don't install the blades myself, so we haven't used it for the installation of blades, but the message we had was that once the wind gets over 12 knots, they have to stop installing the blades. And what we're looking at doing with Roborigger is to increase that window by maybe another three or four knots, which might give an extra 20 or 30% increase to the weather window. Um, and that, that would be an extremely valuable thing. Um, so actually making 
the installation of wind turbine blades quicker and easier is one of our future focuses for RoboRigger. Uh, I can't actually say how, much, how long it is currently taking them, but it's, um, you know, I don't know whether they install three a day or, or one a day. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much, Derek, and thank you all for these super interesting questions. Um, once again, thanks for attending this morning. Uh, we will share the material used during the webinar in the next couple of days, so both the um, slides and also the rewatch of the webinar. If you would like to discover more, please head to our website, technologycatter.com, and so you can get to know this technology further. Thank you once again, Derek, and thank, thank you. you so much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Hope you all enjoyed it. See ya.